I did a lot of TV movies first, Boy in the Plastic Bubble and The Gathering, and then went on to make Grease, Blue Lagoon, White Fang, Honey, I Blew Up the Kid, Getting It Right, It's My Party. I remember very clearly the first time that I was aware of AIDS because uh, the writer of Grease, Bronte Woodard, the guy who wrote the screenplay, we suddenly heard that he was in the hospital with hepatitis. And we thought, wow, it's, that's unusual. And then a couple days later, we heard he died. And then we were in shock. How could he die of hepatitis? We found out that he was probably the first AIDS case that, that, uh, that we knew of. And um, I went to the funeral, and he was there in his casket. They were playing Grease songs on the organ. It was very surreal. We couldn't believe that this friend of ours had died, like, overnight almost. And that was the first time. And then it became like a regular event. A lot of my colleagues died, a lot of other directors. Colin Higgins, wonderful director of um, so many movies like uh, The Best Little Horror House in Texas and other movies. He and Emil Ardellino um, and people, crew members like Bruce Weintraub, a production designer that I worked with, and Robert Redding who designed the makeup for Elvira and was a good friend. Um, so many of them are gone. Harry Stein graduated from um, Cal Arts along with um, Tim Burton and other people. He was a designer and an architect. He, he did uh, artwork and sculpture and, and furniture design and uh, very, very talented, um, knew art really well. Uh, and uh, helped me when I was doing Summer Lovers, that's how I met him. I was shooting in the Greek islands and he had heard of that project and he spoke Greek. So he tracked me down and said he wanted to come and help and translate and so that's how we met. And he came and helped a lot with that and that, then we were together for about five years, I guess. I th think you just said I got it. I, I think you just came in one day and had, had the test and realized that he had it. Then, of course, some, a lot of time went by before any, any symptoms showed up, and that's when we were dealing with all these other people who were dropping off and, uh, and trying to help them through it. He was resigned when he told me, and we, I think we probably collapsed in each other's arms because we knew that that was the end for him, basically. At that time, there were no drugs to fix it, so it was a death sentence if you, if you were diagnosed as having AIDS. So. There was really no hope at all. This disease, PML, uh, attacks the brain and it uh, makes you start forgetting things and, and, and uh, that's when you know you're start, it's starting to happen. And so I remember getting a phone call um, from his car and he said, hey, I, I just uh, smacked into a car. Can you come and get me? So. He told me where I was and I drove there and he was all upset because he had lost control of his car. And he was forgetting keys, he was forgetting this and that and uh, he started to realize that it was creeping up on him. He went to have an MRI and the doctor um, showed him lesions that were starting to appear on his brain. It's called progressive multifocal encephalopathy because it's progressive. Once it starts it happens really fast. So he knew there wasn't a lot of time once the once the symptoms started happening that uh, before he would lose everything. He was close friends with his doctor and his doctor had an assistant who was known in the community as the person who would help people if they needed it to uh, end, the, end their lives. <sighs> I mean, it's, it's so bizarre because he looked totally healthy. He, he had no sign of any kind of disease. He was in great shape and very muscular and uh, tan and looked totally regular, you know, there was no sign of anything. And the idea that he was going to kill himself uh, was just hard to even conceive. But he was very strong, he wanted to be in control of his life and death. He wanted to uh, not let the disease take over him. He wanted to be, be in control of the disease. He said, I'm checking out. Um, I've got this disease that's going to turn me into a vegetable, and I'm checking out, so come and have a one last party. 
His mother, his father, his uh, cousin, his all our friends were there. Uh, Paul Rubens, um, a, a, a guy who used to run in Interview Magazine, Mark Ballot, flew out from New York. All the people that that he had known and hung out with for the last, you know, ten years probably, he called. And then there were people that he called that couldn't make it, like Helen Bonham Carter, who uh, I had worked with on a movie, and, and Harry had met her, and so he called her and woke her up um, in England and said goodbye. And, uh, Hello, uh, Helena. I'm. This is Harry. I am uh, just wanted to say goodbye because I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. And this is like at 9 o'clock in the morning in, in, uh, in England. I don't know what she thought. At the party, he would go around and take pictures with people and laugh and joke and, and drink and make, make, uh, make jokes with people. And, and then he, when somebody had to leave, he'd walk off with them and say goodbye to them. And then he would come back in the party and do his whole thing again. So it was ups and downs and ups and downs. And you know, when, when, he was, when he was in a group situation, everybody would be laughing and joking. And then the moment he left, everybody would fall down and, t and cry and all that because we were trying to keep the spirits up for him. It just got real late. And uh, I think, oh, I remember, they, they said they want everyone to leave except the family. So they were getting people to, to exit, you know, all the, all the friends. And, um, I asked uh, his mother if I could stay, and she said yes. And so we all stayed quite late. And then I don't remember how I was probably too drunk to remember how I left. You know, it was uh, lots and lots of drinking that night. But uh, I remember he was carried into the bedroom, and and I went to say goodbye to him. And then I I took off. I was able to have final moments, and uh, and. Uh, it was very hard because I put my arm around him and I could feel how hard his his neck was, his neck muscles, and realized that in a moment, in a few hours, he was going to be gone. It just was so unbelievable the whole situation, and uh, very very emotional and very draining. At the end, he was with his doctor's assistant, who was there to help if there was any problems in exiting, and. Uh, I, I think he had t he'd taken cocaine and drinking and everything, so he, he, his body was like a mess and needed probably, I guess, some help. I was scheduled to fly back east for Christmas the next day, and on the way to the airport, I drove back to his house, and I went to the back porch where, where his bedroom was, and I knew that he was lying in there, having died, and... Uh, I just sat on the porch for a while. I didn't go in, I didn't see him, but I just was there. And then I went to the airport. So it was, I just, I didn't want to go straight to the airport. I, 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 was, I couldn't believe that he was gone, but he was. Well, I went to Hawaii uh, to, to, um, to recover from that experience. And then Joel Thurm, who was at the party, uh, flew over to hang out with me. And uh, he brought pictures that he had taken at the party. And at first I was, I was worried about looking at them. And then I said, OK, show them to me. So I looked at the pictures, and I just said, this has to be a movie. It's like such an obvious thing. And so I started that, at that point writing the script. I mean, put the photos into a book. And I, uh, at the time, I was supposed to have a, <laughs> a deal at Disney to do an adult movie because I had done Honey, I Blew Up the Kid for them in exchange for an adult movie. So I took the book and showed it to Jeff Katzenberg and Michael Eisner and said, this is the movie I want to do next. <laughs> and they <laughs> freaked out. This is not a Disney movie. So they said no. And uh, my agent at the time, Jim Wyatt, sent me to see John Calley, who was at the time just starting United Artists. He had just gone in. So I went and showed him the book of photos and told him the story and uh, got in my car and left. And on the way, driving away, I got a call that it was a, a green light. After the party, I, when I was writing the screenplay, I, I interviewed everybody who was there and asked them about what went on. And so I took down notes about each little vignette of how he said goodbye to each person, and we restaged those. 
So everything that's in that movie is pretty much uh, real, except for the fact that um, I portrayed my character as a villain because I needed to have <laughs> some kind of a, a drama. I wasn't really like that. I, I, I just needed to have a, a foil. The original cast was Chris Maloney and Viggo Mortensen, who were both unknown at the time. So we said, okay, we're ready to go. And then the studio suddenly said, well, wait, we're a little worried. We want to get some names in there instead. So we had to let them go. And then we recast with um, Eric Roberts and Gregory Harrison. Eric Roberts somehow was able to totally capture Harry, and, and he had never met him. And uh, it was uncanny how much he was like him. And the same thing goes for Lee Grant playing Harry's mother, because she nailed that, too. Um, that character was exactly like Tessie Stein, and uh, the whole making of that movie was like a big kind of uh, therapy session. We shot It's My Party in, in order, pretty much, so that the whole crew had this impending feeling of the end of the movie and the end of the story. And the last scene that we shot was when he was carried into the bedroom, and, and that's when Lee Grant um, let out this um, wail that um, Greek women often do when, when a death happens in the family, and it was bone chilling. She's not even on camera in the movie, but y you get it. <laughs> and uh, she has, I, I saw some a book or something she wrote or an interview she did where she said she was going through a lot at that time, and that moment was when she let it all out. So that's why it's so real. I saw it at the Beverly Center, yeah. And that was on a Friday night where we used to go, Harry and I, to the Beverly Center to this theater and watch it. And I went there by myself. And that was another surreal experience to watch our story unfold at the place where we used to go to the movies.